once again we are here with our online lecture series that is going on so i welcome you on behalf of the department of english minnapur college i like to heartily welcome all the participants here to this virtual platform who are present over the other side so today with us have a renowned academician from novin bharati university dr pinky shadi and also working as a reviewer for reputed professional journals she is having an active association with the world he has she has made his made her mark in scientific community with a her mom has received several awards for contribution to the scientific community she has major research interest her major research interest involves literary theory and criticism language studies so on behalf of the department of english i welcome you the to this online lecture series and thank you for uh, that you have accepted our invitation and you have consented to be online to address our participants so over to you uh, uh, the hello uh, i hope i am audible uh, am i audible yes, everybody you are, okay. yes yes yeah. you are uh, okay. perfectly audible okay okay i'll try to be audible this is uh, just with my voice i'm not using any uh, audio aid thank you dr kundu for that uh, illustrious uh, well introduction i don't know if i deserve that much and uh, uh, i'm not an expert in literary theory though it has been written in the website but uh, yeah we do have to teach theory and we do uh, collate text with theory anyways uh, um, today my topic of discussion is text and performance now uh, the topic itself uh, is a very very uh, you know broad and a uh, multifaceted topic and uh, i would uh, like to talk about the nuances before even i begin talking about uh, how do we tend to think of text and performance the nuances that go with uh, the idea of performance what is performance uh, now when we say text and performance we are actually linking them up together but we have to think that whether even if we don't link up text to performance can we really talk about performance by itself and there have been very very known and famous uh, theoreticians about performance like richard shekna there has been john searl there has been uh, you know many couple of many others and uh, uh, well austin and others and uh, many more they have talked about performance each in varying and in different ways and there are so many ways that open up when we talk about the word performance the very fact that i am sitting here today and talking to you maybe is also performance and i think it is because you see uh, when we are talking about the term the word text we know that a text is scripted it is written down and uh, any kind of divergences or variations from that written material is difficult when we are talking about performance in particular relation to that text then performance is dependent on that text sure but it is not wholly dependence because performance can exist by itself and how does this happen dr kundu please remind me if my voice goes off hello uh hello hello yes yes yes, yes. you are uh, perfectly please, audible please remind you are perfectly please, audible yeah please do stop. Okay, okay okay fine okay. fine i can't okay. okay so uh performance is that which uh, is something uh, as richard shekner says is organized behavior it is planned it is organized it is restored and it is twice or maybe thrice practiced behavior 
Now, how can we say it is thrice or twice practiced behavior? And why do we use the word practiced? Do we need to perform only on the stage or can we perform anywhere? Uh, or maybe for that matter, anywhere, anytime, in any situation, in any circumstance, in any dialogue, in any uh, kind of one-to-one uh, -one interaction. So you see, uh, according to Shekhar, as he says, that, that the word performance was not very much in vogue until the, you know, the 20th century, because performance only meant things which were, uh, you know, not that way, uh, not beyond the purview of drama or action or something like that. But it emerged in a more full-fledged manner in the 1950s due to certain uh, you know, preliminary work in this area. Uh, and uh, we have one very brilliant example of uh, the idea or the, the concept of performance, which uh, uh, was formed by John Cage and Cunningham in, uh, 19, in the 1950s in Black Mountain College in North Carolina, where uh, they were not talking about any drama. They were talking, they had uh, performed something and uh, they had named it Six Happenings in 18 Parts. Now, this is very intrigued, intriguing. You see, Six Happenings. Now, what are happenings? Wow. Happenings can be anything. And uh, uh, from here, there is this vital, this vital, uh, well, a sequence of questions that follow on performance as to what can be happenings and what can be action, and how is action related to performance and how is non-action also related to performance? Do we perform before a, a, an audience or do we perform by ourselves? Are we alone when we perform or do, is it part of our lives? There are so many questions and uh, Schechter says that he himself, when he was writing books on performance, when he was delivering uh, lectures on performance and when he was trying to theorize the concept of performance was very much, much indebted to Erwin Goffman. Erwin Goffman had said that we are always performing. There is a very interesting book by Erwin Goffman and it is uh, titled The Presentation of the Self in Everyday Life. Now, what is the presentation of the self? What does presentation of the self mean? The presentation of the self means how we interact with our family, with our near and uh, dear ones, how we interact when somebody uh, rings the doorbell, how do we send messages, how do we dress when we are going to a party, how do we project ourselves when we are in the classroom, uh, do, are we our natural selves or how do we act out our emotions, how do we live our lives. So that's a very interesting thing. And uh, he takes up uh, a line from Shakespeare and uh, Goffman says that all the world is a stage. So uh, everybody is actually performing on the stage and this is a world where performance is everywhere. And that's very interesting. Uh, and uh, he said that performance is not always related to performing arts. It can be related to sociology. It can be related to sports because Sports, uh, you need to have some kind of a result before the audience when somebody, there is a sports competition. Uh, when there is wrestling, for example, think of wrestling. How when two people are wrestling with each other, they're actually acting uh, out their parts as wrestlers. But uh, behind this acting out their part as wrestlers, they're also trying to uh, kind of make the audience feel that what they're seeing is real. So uh, even if it is organized behavior, even if it is planned behavior, going back to where I started, where Shekna says that uh, performance uh, and which is similar to ritual and uh, which actually encompasses the term ritual and ritual and performance, they coalesce, they merge, they kind of, uh, you know, relate to each other. These are behaviors which come together and which are complementary. Sometimes they are, uh, you know, uh, they relate to each other in varying ways. And so uh, when Goffman was uh, actually writing this book, The Presentation of the Self in Everyday Life, 
He talks about the theater as well. He talks about human beings and day to day interactions. And we have two more very interesting books by him, which uh, are the ideological, uh, you know, theorization of the idea or the term performance. And one of them is frame analysis. Uh, what is frame analysis? I am sitting in front of you. I am bound by a frame, maybe the frame of this, uh, well, my computer screen. And there is another screen which is viewing me. So it is the second frame which is framing me. And there is a wider audience outside, the third audience, who is again framing the second screen and the first screen. And there, be, there may be an infinite number of screens. So frame analysis is how uh, everything is ideologically constructed and nothing is static. There's no such thing as passive behavior. There's no such thing as passive reception. So uh, there are infinite number of frames which uh, which try to grasp, try to, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, uh, explain our being and explain our actions or maybe uh, try to receive signal signs from the way we behave, the way we talk, the way we live out our lives. Yes. And uh, I will also talk about uh, another book, which is called another book by Goffman, which is called Interaction Ritual. This is also on performance. and. Uh, because I was talking about Schechner as well, Schechner says that interaction ritual is related, very much related to performance. And he, they were friends at one point of time and Schechner had long conversations with Goffman and he agrees that ritual is a part of any performance, just as ritual is a part of any, uh, by ritual we mean stylized behavior something that is meant for a purpose, which needs to serve a purpose, even if it is a trivial purpose for that instance. And uh, these kind of rituals exist in both human and in the animal world. In the animal world, it exists in the, in the form of symbols, signs, sounds, excuse me. In the human world, rituals exist because they have the long, uh, well, the legacy of tradition, maybe the legacy of religion, one can think of innumerable number of rituals in, uh, uh, you know, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, where we come together as a community, where people come together and whether you accept it or not, uh, whether you, uh, in fact, believe them or not, they do exist. They do have some kind of a sanction for which we still, uh, uh, you know, we cannot do away with them. Uh, at any point of time. So uh, coming to this, uh, coming back to this, then uh, should we limit the word performance only to the idea of theater? Not at all, because uh, theater, drama, or any kind of, uh, you know, staging is actually only a very small part of the wide, coming under the wide rubric of performance. In the American Lexicon Dictionary, Performance would mean something which is very different. It is a confluence of avant-garde or postmodern or uh, newer forms of visual arts or music or uh, well uh, dance practices or any kind of uh, you know uh, well uh, playing out before the audience, which has uh, not maybe uh, which has not taken place earlier. So it can be anything it can be something absolutely new so uh, the very idea of performance is very dynamic it changes but then if we look at uh, uh, this theater how performance takes place in the theater you see uh, planned behavior when we say planned behavior and when we are acting our parts in the theater a character actually acts out the part the actor actually acts out the part of a character now this character and actor are two different things the actor is the the person playing the part of that particular character they are entirely two different beings they may come together if the actor has understood the essence of that character or uh, they might even uh, not converge in their essential 
separation or difference in their essential point of uh, well diversification or maybe moving away one can understand or one can comment on the character but this is very interesting because you see uh, if we closely uh, there is uh, i would like to give you an example in this regard and i would like to talk about pirandello pirandello's play six characters in search of an actor where when we teach this to our students at the university level uh, we don't always go by the framework of the theater of the absurd is much more involved and it is much more performative uh, the very idea of characters existing alongside actors and why uh, characters are more important than actors or vice versa and how do uh, how do actors need to uh, whether actors need to be there at all if there are characters and how do characters come alive and uh, this kind of binary is very well expressed in that play now uh, coming back to performance as i said theater at one point of time was meant exclusively for two classes it was meant for the upper class and it was meant for the lower classes but with the rise of the bourgeois and more appropriately in the 20th century there was the need that theater performed a social function so the audience were not just passive receivers they were active agents of change while even they were watching a performance and how does this active agent of change comes about through this idea of performance not only with people who are acting on the stage but with people who are viewing them and before i even go on to this because i would like to mention augusto boal but even before i mention boal let me tell you that according to shekner he says that if performance means any action now i'm talking with you so this could be performance as well and if it's planned out well it is performance uh if performance is any planned restored uh well revised reorganized or organized behavior then in that instance shekna says that there has to be a second condition present with that organized restored planned behavior and what is that condition that needs to be there the condition is is there an audience or not there has to be at least maybe one audience at least maybe maybe i am performing maybe i am i am uh, my own natural self i am not performing i am just my own natural self but somebody is looking at me somebody is seeing me doing my daily actions and that becomes performance so performance is not only from the point of view of the doer it can be from the point of view of the receiver and that, that is that adds a dimension that adds a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, well uh, complexity to the term performance when we say that it is not only from the point of view of the doer but also from the point of view of the receiver and here uh, we see how the the theater director or the person who is actually training actors or how the person who is actually arranging people for performance uh, what vital role he plays all right so uh, uh, i was uh, talking about the audience in the theater and i was telling you that how uh, you see the with the emergence and with the uh, you know uh, there were various uh, uh, events for example the workers theater movement in britain from the 1928 to the 1936 uh, to the year 1936 and uh, during this phase uh, not only the uh, the concept of performance as performance art uh, didn't exist so much it was just drama plays etc but if you see what was happening though the term evolved later the word performance evolved later but if you see if we see very minutely what was happening and what dramatists and theorists were trying to do we will see that the idea of performance had already crept in maybe the word was lacking if we think of a play by augusto boal where he tries to dissolve the 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 the, the uh, i mean uh, the stratifications the differences between the stage the platform where uh, 
the drama is acted out and the spectators and how uh, he talks about the term spect actor then we can very well see that these these lines are blurred they are merged so in fact there is no separate spectator and there is no separate actor because if at a particular point in the play somebody feels that there's this this is going wrong and it should have been like this and the play would have been better that way instead of this way then the the the, the spectator can just come up on the stage and uh, make the uh, remove the character and act out what he feels could have been the right moment at this point of time so uh, the idea of performance had been there actually uh, and ritual again ritual which is very closely and intimately linked with performance is also a very important uh, place in human behavior as i said it does have it in animal behavior as well and anthropologists and researchers we have infinite number of uh, behavioral patterns among animals where they when they come up to mate when they try to fight in groups when they fight singly when they are being defeated when a set of uh, 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 during uh, when a tiger is say for example trying to hunt a deer and uh, the rest of the animals who are spectators they they uh, they emit sounds and they they kind of try to relate to the incident or they kind of try to grasp the delicacy i mean the 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 the, the nuances of the situation and the sensitivity of the situation in different ways that is also ritual maybe that happens again and again and again so ritualized behavior as much as is there in the animal world also exists in humans and just the other way around when we are talking about performance uh we can also see that in our daily lives uh as uh shekna says that we use various rhetorical and uh well uh, other devices which maybe are also done in the theater but we have and we lead multiple lives i am a person outside uh, a different person outside a different person at home a different person with the one that i love a different person with my children so we lead so many roles now these roles are also ritualistic so we we enact multiple roles and we have on stage and off stage behaviors uh, we 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 kind of we kind of uh, move on between these layers we permute we uh, you know we uh, we kind of permeate one to the other and then we come back to the first one and then we go and dive on to the second one and then we go on to the third one our lives are like this just as it is in the theater where an actor has to enact the part of the character and throughout uh, the history of ideas we have seen that there is no one there can be no one single theory that says that well this should have been like this or uh performance should have been like this because we see when we look at the plays of ibsen when we look at the play uh, with writings of uh, maxim gorky or uh, uh, say for example uh, well shekhov or springberg or uh, maybe uh, anybody else or bernard shaw we see that with each performance style uh, we leave behind messages and these messages are very important and in uh long back uh, you see dario fo had talked about the body as the site of performance and uh if uh, you know uh, very very minutely if we consider the stage as a site s i t e of performance we will see that what is it actually that guides performance what is it actually that from which the germ uh, you know of performance emanates is it the speech which controls the body or is it the body that controls the speech and i think that there is a lot of discussion which we need to do on this that uh, just giving you a script or a speech defines the person or is the person defining the speech and that is very important and uh, we can think of uh, mayor holes uh, you see the dynamics of the body okay and how he talks about uh the scientific he he draws from the scientific uh you know phenomena of biomechanics and he says that the actor's body is a, a very contested site of meanings 
and it is from here this the actor's body it is the body which gives you uh, the the energy the fervor the the the, the very uh, the very uh, uh, you see the, the the main springs of performance apart from any written text that could have uh, ever given you that idea and i think that is a very important point because uh, see when we talk about adaptations uh, when we talk about adaptations uh, it is the same thing because there is already a written script in relation to the idea of text and performance because here i'm to speak about text and performance so uh, there is a written script obviously but then why do when we uh, when when there are multiple adaptations of a play we can change the script we can keep certain aspects of the script or certain portions of the script intact and sometimes we can of course do away with the script altogether we can just concentrate on the idea of performance and i would like to mention uh, in relation to hamlet one particular i haven't uh, i haven't uh, been fortunate enough to know about all the adaptations of hamlet because i am not uh, an expert uh, with shakespeare's uh, dramas but uh, i would like to recall the adaptation of shakespeare's hamlet by howard barker and in this particular play you see uh, it is titled gertrude the cry it is an adaptation of hamlet without the name hamlet it is definitely an adaptation and gertrude the cry actually is based on the character of hamlet's mother and this is a very surreal a very different kind of play which is very raw and which is uh, you know takes you deep down into uh, your subconscious and then it comes back to pronounce a judgment on the fact that whether uh, whether hamlet is the only character that we concentrate on or not so it is changing the point of view it is changing the script it is changing the orientation of the play but what we have is the basic storyline and what we have is a very very multi dimensional uh, view of performance performance as an art performance as a practice performance whether planned restored or whatever but performance essentially now uh, there is another very interesting idea about performance which uh, people believe that if there are ritual arts then in those ritual arts we are not much allowed to uh, you know make many changes so ritual arts are more fixed they're more rigid in non ritual arts we might have holes and we might have spaces where we can intrude and we uh, we can uh, you know incorporate or uh, put in something that we want to then again we have the concept of the liminoid arts what are the liminoid arts doing are uh, are they a transition between uh, one copy to the other because you see uh, shekner also says that when we are on stage it is not our natural behavior that we would rather want to do when we not watched when we are not watched by uh, rather uh, when we don't want to be conscious that we are watched so it is the copy of a behavior that we want to assume at that point of time in order to impress in order to pron pronounce a judgment in order to uh, in order for other people to frame us the idea of the frame that i was talking about so uh, in fact when somebody is trying to frame us and this kind of organized behavior uh, and when we are not aware of that behavior what is what is the connecting link and uh, uh, is liminoid art that uh, trying to trace that transition between one copy and the other copy or something in between is there an intermediary space which we can afford to find or negotiate is another important question when we talking about performance i would also like to uh, very briefly uh, talk about what austin believed performance to have been now he was uh, uh, his ideas about performance was 
uh, rather very, uh, you see, strictly laid down with regard to speech act theories. When is when do we uh, you know make a good speech act when we are sincere when we can express what we want to express when we are trying to uh, exponentially prove something when we are trying to explain something and we have adequate uh, points and ideas to support what we are saying is, is, is obviously an example of a good speech act but any act which is actually speech uh, according to Austin can be to of two kinds one is constitutives and the other one is performatives constitutives can be normal statements they can be emphatic statements they can be uh, well uh, uh, just a just a recognition that uh, of a fact or maybe uh, just a statement stating certain truths or maybe certain happenings or wishing something to take place so that that is uh, constitutives. What is performatives? According to Austin, performatives because uh, performance goes beyond language, and uh, that is uh, one of the things which we can never, uh, you see, uh, disregard. Performatives are those statements that hint at an action which is being done, which would be done, which would be completed, or is in the process of completion or is so emphatic, is so important that uh, it deserves, needs to be done. So performatives is the idea of a speech performing an act. And that is very interesting because how does a speech perform an act? And he gives a very interesting example. He says that when a couple gets married and goes to the priest in the church and the priest performs the ceremony, that, which involves, of course, a ritual and a very elaborate ritual, uh, the priest at the end of the ritual says, I pronounce you man and wife. Now, this man and wife is a categorical statement and which means that the person, the, the man and the woman ought to be man and wife all throughout their lives. And the identity has been given to them uh, and so this this is a performative act similarly when somebody says that there's a strike tomorrow there is a curfew tomorrow uh, or you have to get out of my class this very moment that is a performative act because we are trying to show that how speech how words can actually make you act enact uh the 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 import of that speech itself i mean give shape to that speech in action and that is very important and austin says that there are uh, in speech there are certain other aspects there are certain other components and uh, i would like to mention three uh, components of uh, uh, the first one is misfires and austin says that when I have said something, when he says something, or when a character says something, and that word or that statement is not clear, and uh, well, uh, it gives a wrong idea, or uh, it has a different import than what it was meant to create, that is what is the meaning of the word misfires. And a lot of understanding goes with this word misfires, that a particular word can be so powerful linguistically that it can misfire the entire, or it can you know, create a topsy-turvy situation where it has been misunderstood. Misinvocation, quote unquote, misinvocation, where a wrong set of, uh, well, devices, actions, uh, interpretation of that word has been carried out. So misinvocation, wrong invocation of what it actually was meant to be. And misexecution of a speech act, quote unquote, misexecution. Misexecution is again when a particular speech act is not fulfilled as it should have been there is something missing there is something which uh, does not quite uh, qualify in relation to what the speech demanded 
So a speech, as Austin shows, is never passive. And how the speech itself can turn performative before we have the, the, the very concept of performance before us. Then again, uh, we might think of, uh, you see, uh, well, uh, on the stage when we are talking about performance, we can think of such things as the body itself, the gendered body. How do we define or how do we relate to gender stereotyping? And here I would like to read out what uh, Butler says. And uh, it is very interesting. I'm sorry for my lack of memory that I don't remember uh, the, you see the quotation or I could have just said it from memory. I read, begin quotes, gender ought not to be constructed as a stable identity or a locus of identity from which various acts follow. Rather, gender is an identity Tenuously constituted in time, instituted in an, an exterior space through a stylized repetition of acts. And I'll read one more close quote. I'll read one more uh, quote. Now, stylized repetition of acts, which means that it has been practiced, it has been known, it has been much in vogue, and so we associate with it commonly. So once again, ritualized behavior maybe. Once again, the idea that it is planned, it is organized, it is restored to be done again and again and again. And here you see what, uh, what kind of performance that gender entails is, uh, is very nicely given by Butler. And uh, well, uh, there is another thing which uh, I would like to comment on, and uh, well, uh, Austin is also talking about weakened speech. Uh, what is weakened speech act? And weakened speech act is where the performance of that speech act is not very strong, even if it is evoking some kind of a performative act. Okay, so uh, when, uh, you know, we are thinking it on a broader, uh, uh, on the platter of a broader category, uh, speech act may or may not induce performance, but say for example, uh, when we are thinking about children's play, children playing uh, at a particular point of time, and when we are thinking about war games, or when we are thinking about adult games, and when we are thinking about any kind of performance, whether it be a concert, a solo dance, or maybe a singing competition, or maybe a solo singer singing, or maybe an elocution or a random extempo speech, they all come under the broad category of performance. So you see, uh, this is a much difficult term when we look at it uh, from that side of uh, uh, the, the lens. And uh, as John Searle also says that performance has two broad areas. I'm not going into very many details, but uh, there are two things which another uh, very important critic points out and he talks about the the quotient of the mind how the mind receives and how the mind comprehends performance uh, and how the mind believes or views performance and how society mandates performance and it is the uh, it is the collated uh, kind of a relation between these two aspects of the mind which is unseen and and the performativity that runs in society as uh, as something which is uh, valid, as something which is well uh, accepted, uh, it is that uh, it is that liminal space between these two that actually creates performance, the actual performance, and uh, it may be a copy of a copy or a, a double copy of a copy, as uh, where uh, Shekhar says many times that 
uh, you know, we, we, when we are on the stage, we are not normal. Sometimes we want to perform in a particular way. And this performing in a particular way is actually the copy of an organized behavior. It is not spontaneous. So uh, that is also performance nevertheless, because it is organized, it is planned. But uh, as I said, there are levels of performance. And it is here that uh, there are various shades and nuances of performance as well apart from performance just being put up on the stage and performance in relation to theater, drama, dramaturgy, uh, performance in relation to uh, people uh, uh, exposing themselves to public. The, the very fact that they aren't doing anything is also performance. So performance can have a multivalent uh, uh, you know, interpretation. And uh, I would uh, like to read out another very interesting quote. And uh, well, uh, yes. Uh, hello. Hello. Hello, uh, Dr. Kundu, can you hear me? Hello. Hello, Dr. Kundu, can you hear me? Okay, I think there shouldn't be any problem. Uh, hello? Just give me a moment. Yes. So uh, when I was talking about performance, uh, I was also trying to uh, in the beginning, when I talked about performance, I was trying to tell you as to how uh, in the frame analysis, Irving Goffman was trying to tell you the importance of frames that frame, uh, you know, multiple number of times an interaction ritual where rituals can have, uh, you know, importance. They can have prevalent uh, usages, even in contemporary societies. Uh, they can have importance in our present lives and they can they have may have received far back into the past but they are nevertheless always there and uh, so uh, the idea of performance is multi-dimensional and it emerges from uh, well uh, very very uh, uh, multiple uh, origins and it has multiple origins or it has multiple usages also in contemporary times not only in uh, in literature not only in linguistics and not only in drama but also in the sphere of management also in the sphere of uh, say gender studies, uh, because uh, when we are talking about Judith Butler or any other, uh, you know, uh, connection with uh, what uh, uh, gendering or materiality of the gendered body means, we obviously can talk about uh, gender studies in relation to performance, and it is also important in relation to uh, in, in relation to the discipline of history. It is important so far as philosophy is concerned, because theorizing of performance is very important. It is important so far as economics is concerned. It is important so far as marketing is concerned. It is important so far as management is concerned. There are so many diverse uh, areas where performance matters. Performance for fulfilling a particular function. If somebody is, uh, you know, uh, well, uh, uh, bringing results which can help uh, in in his uh, job uh, profile or which can help a company get mileage over uh other companies and that becomes performance so performance can mean so many different things uh without even these finer shades of theorizing that we have with uh literary critics and scholars and um, well uh theorists of drama and performance uh so uh that was uh, more or less all and uh well if uh, i don't know if uh my time permits i would just like to point out to one particular quote and uh, yes uh, i would like to end by this particular quote which I felt was very interesting and uh, and this is in relation to gender uh, 
within quotes, the effect of gender is produced through the stylization of the body and hence must be understood as the mundane way in which bodily gestures, comma, movements and styles of various kinds constitute the illusion of an abiding gendered self. This is from Butler and uh, unquote. So uh, you see illusion once again, the idea of illusion, the idea behind truth and untruth or the fine space that divides these two uh, in relation to performance, in relation to gender, in relation to any other uh, interpretive acts. This is a thing that we must remember. This is a liminal line that we must tread in order to trace how text is represented in performance and how performance would have a different uh, set of standards by which to judge if they can be qualities together. I think they do always exist side by side, but not quite the same. So today, as I end the discussion on text and performance, uh, my personal view of performance is that uh, there are still theories, there are still uh, theater itself is experimenting with performance because if we think of Carol Churchill in Britain today, uh, Carol Churchill's plays are, they don't have script. Now, can we ever think of a play which does not have a script? Yes, it does not have a script. There is a group of characters who enact, you, who, who come together in groups. Uh, there may be two or three groups and they, they kind of work out similar situations in each groups are not told as to which situation they would be uh, you know, doing in relation to um, the event which uh, has been uh, just told to them and it's not a planned thing. So they do it just on the spur of the moment and they do it, do it just then. And what comes out of it through these games, through these games, uh, a script comes out and uh, two or three groups, they take in parts uh, of what they have enact enacted through games, through role playing, through rituals, and that becomes a complete play. And it's very interesting that uh, you see this, uh, this, this kind of uh, a play, even before it is staged as a final performance, is already performance. Yeah, and that's very interesting because uh, I, was just, uh, I was just forgetting something again, which, uh, which uh, is, there's a similar thing to this. Uh, uh, well, uh, Carol Churchill uh, has been writing experimental plays which uh, allow, uh, you see these, uh, of course, uh, actors to practice this kind of a thing where uh, they can, uh, you know, uh, they can take a, they can take a situation, they can take a, uh, an event and they can act it out. But uh, if we go back to Brecht, uh, I'll just take one more minute. Uh, if we go ba back to Brecht and uh, what Brecht was doing in the Leha Stuk, which was uh, uh, the learning play, the Leha Stuk, which was the learning play, which he started from 1929 and he, uh, he kind of uh, tried to perfect it till 1933. Uh, in this learning play, actors were actually learning how to act. So there were multiple performances of the, uh, of the, uh, of the one particular play. And when the play as a final performance was put up, that was entirely different.
Hello. Uh, can Dr. Kulu, yes, can you hear me? Yes, uh, yes, the, you are audible and you can continue. Dr. Kulu, can you hear me? Yes, uh, we can hear you. Hello? Yes, you are audible. Yeah, so uh, I was on the last thing of my uh, finishing my discussion and here, uh, uh, just give me a moment, I'll put this off because devices which are making sounds and I guess that's very disturbing. Just give me a moment. Yes, so uh, I was concluding including portion of my story, I was talking about uh, how uh, Carol Churchill's plays, even before the final play is out on the stage, has already been performed multiple number of times through, uh, uh, you know, playing games and uh, game playing is again a part of, uh, has been and could be a part of uh, uh, framing uh, the idea of performance even before a uh, fully uh, well uh, rehearsed play is out. Yes, uh, uh, is... Uh, I was being asked if uh, I would, uh, I think uh, somebody pinned me for a question and I'm almost at the end. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry about the fact that the internet went off and I'm not quite internet savvy, but thankfully I got it back. Yes. So Dr. Kundu, if there are any questions about uh, yes, uh, the, the uh, thing that uh, I just spoke on. The, there is a good observation from uh, Niladrida, Niladiranjan Chatterjee. So, yes. Hmm. Yes. Yes, and then there is a question uh, uh, put by Miladrida again. Yes, in fact, uh, I haven't uh, really seen much of Cage and Cunningham's performance, but uh, uh, I have been by the idea that uh, in uh, the 50s and now, uh, later on as well, uh, music genres uh, combined and even dance and performance, uh, uh, there was uh, the, the category of dance and performance was blurred. So it could have been performance simply rather than dance. And I think uh, a more uh, nuanced research on this would definitely help me to answer this question. But I had seen um, a, a, a performance by, it was directed by Cunningham long back. And uh, I didn't get the proper link, but I saw that uh, it was neither dance nor was it dialogue. It was something that uh, approximated to something in between, and that that was quite interesting. Yes, and uh, uh, I would love to explore this area further. Well, uh, uh, you see, uh, at that point of time, uh, the interpretation of Shakespeare's drama, th thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Patro, but uh, the interpretation of uh, performance and uh, closet drama, which uh, by itself is uh, something different. Uh, you see, uh, I don't think uh, that uh, this, this would have been a question in times as such. Uh, well, uh, I think that this argument stands valid as, uh, for today because when I was talking about Gertrude the Cry as an adaptation of Hamlet, uh, you see uh, uh, the, entire, the entire kind of uh, subject matter or the play as a whole, the stress on the main character changes. So uh, why not? It is still, uh, you know, Shakespeare's plays have always been performed on stage there. There was a, a you know wrong number of performances for many of us, and uh, I don't think that uh, well uh, this holds uh, good today. But uh, yes, of course, as a genre, uh, as a closet drama, maybe uh, with uh, various uh, you know added features to it, this could uh, be a question, but not quite because uh, I don't so much agree with this point. Uh, I think that uh, I hope the dancers. Well, uh, this is interesting. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Patro, for this very interesting observation. Uh, see, when an actor is uh, acting out his part and when, a, uh, when a, uh, well, a spectator is 
looking at him did you mention actant while performing a role in the play distance between actor and an and actant while performing a role in the play uh, uh, did you mean a spectator i mean is is that the right word you used or did you mean the character see i would like to comment with regard to this can you hear me hello can you hear me can you hear me yes adi uh, am i audible actually they yeah. are uh, yes the are audible yeah 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 i would like to say that so, uh, uh, the, uh, this this yeah. platform me uh, yes. yeah yeah in this uh, platform like uh, to... uh, they they are just watching you on youtube and facebook so mm -hmm. they are not uh, uh, able to uh, interact with you directly okay so do i answer their questions hello do i, uh, do yes, I answer yes. their questions yes yes, yes. yes. so uh, what i was trying to say is that when an actor and i mentioned this while i was speaking when an actor performs a character this basic difference uh, between the actor and the, uh, the character the character is something which is fixed with his script which uh, giving life to that character is something which the actor has to do and that is very difficult the actor has to put himself into the shoes of the character and there are spaces which have to be filled in and if they are not filled in uh, if the character does fully become the actor then uh, i i guess that uh, this point of separation from this point of separation you see there is a comment which uh which uh, can or uh, as a uh, spectator scan or which uh, the the actor himself can point out about the character because that is where the the space has been created the the, the intersection between these two uh you know uh, different worlds the world of the actor and the world of the character uh, and this is where performance steps in this is where performance exactly steps in that is an ideological uh, well uh, you know problem which has to be bridged i guess i hope that answers the question so uh, yes okay so the uh, as we don't have any more questions for this session so we will quickly move towards the our next session uh, that is on how absurd mm -hmm. was the theater of the absurd some re reflections mm -hmm. through plays and again uh, the resource person is uh, dr pinky isha uh, assistant professor of english from rovindra bharati university so i thank uh, participants for their patience uh, they are waiting eagerly uh, again some of them they have commented in the youtube channel box uh, comment box that uh, they are again waiting eagerly for the next session so without further delay further ado we will uh, begin our next session so over to you okay uh, yes uh, thank you so much uh, dr kundu for uh, being of tremendous help with uh, can you just help me with this cup Uh, for uh, tremendous help during the disconnection phases i mean i'm so sorry about that disconnection hope that doesn't occur again just to keep it a little no actually this you is know, bit unprecedented yes uh, yeah this is bit exactly unprecedented. so exactly so we cannot tie it uh, right you know, exactly and my wifi tends to go off every time there is a uh, you know uh, there, there is some kind of a cloudy weather okay so without wasting time uh how uh, the next uh, lecture of mine is uh, uh how absurd was the theater of the absurd with reflections uh, from a face now uh the theater of the absurd was an european phenomena which we all know but i wish to step back a little uh before i start with the theater of the absurd proper and i wish to say that the theater of the absurd didn't happen all of a sudden and it was uh, really not absurd uh, 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 there was nothing very absurd about it as such it was very really connected with events back in time i would go back a little and try to just give a few basic points as far as my memory permits me and i would like to start by saying that from the mid 19th century onwards uh 
there were a few movements in the political, the social, the cultural life of people worldwide. In Britain specifically, if we see we have the Chartist movement, we have the trade union movement, we have the rise of the middle class, we have the birth of a very, very interesting uh, alternative to uh, political uh, autocracy, I mean autocracy as a uh, ruling force, and which is Marxism, and we have opening up the dimensions of the mind in the discovery, in the new, uh, you know, discoveries of the mind and of uh, the unconscious states of existence by Sigmund Freud and later on uh, from uh, and uh, uh, well Jung and others and uh, well the disciples who uh, later on they they, they they diversified they moved away from uh, the kind of psychoanalysis that freud was trying to do but nevertheless opening up that vista of the mind a whole game out of uh, sensations that related to uh, subjectivities of the mind uh, relativism of the mind rather than objectification of objects theories and ideas when we come to the 20th century, once again, we have to see that what was happening in the theater. Uh, in the theater, there were these European influences of Ibsen, Bert Brecht, and uh, we see that uh, these created quite a sensation. Because uh, uh, not Brecht exactly so early, but even then, uh, while the the uh, you know the genre of the talkie films had not started when the silent films were going on and when uh after the 20s we have the talkie films coming in and uh, we see how the tradition of the music hall the commedia dell'arte or clowning as a genre how nonsense and how uh, you see the uh, you know, the music hall which was very favorite haunt of the people uh, all this uh, was hadn't stopped actually, and uh, what was happening is that people felt that there was a need for a change, there was a need for some kind of a thing that was related to their lives, much more uh, dominating their uh, part of existence and uh, trying to portray what they were going through. And uh, there were various movements in socialism, and there was the birth of the socialist theater, there was the birth of um, well, the Fabian, uh, the Fabian society right at the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, that history uh, is there by itself. But if we go to uh, the arts, we see that there was uh, also uh, the emergence of two very important art movements. And one of them was Impressionism and the next was Expressionism. So Impressionism and Expressionism together as movements did not mean that they remain confined to the visual arts and to painting or architecture or uh, just the visual arts scenario. It was a kind of perception that affected literature, written literature as well. We can take some instance of, uh, we can take some reference, some very uh, important reference from surrealists because the surrealists taking inspiration from Freud were hinting at those hidden recesses of the mind which we needed to explore and therefore the irrationality uh, behind uh, all uh, happenings in the universe. We can see the Dada movement, which was very short lived, which was a movement, which was a foreign movement, but even in its uh, you know, uh, in its peculiarly short span, it had projected to the world the iconoclastic, the avant-garde sensibilities of people who did not wish to follow the paradigm in theater or in the visual arts or in the performance arts which had been going on. So, you see, as a continuation of this and as going back uh, to surrealism and Dadaism and the idea of the mind as an active force in human lives and how the how the superstructure of religion has crumbled how the traditional faith structures have crumbled and there was no other sustenance which could offer man some possibility of 
uh, a, a sta uh, some stability that could guide his life. Uh, these were uh, some of the ideas that uh, went behind the theater of the absurd when it did emerge in the 1950s and 60s. So uh, it, was a, 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 it was a movement uh, in literature which actually emerged from the post-war destructive trauma phase. And uh, it was, again, uh, you know, uh, very, very, uh, very much affected by the idea of nuclear annihilation whether it would take place in the future what was the place of man in the universe and what was the place of god in relation to man and we have uh, the philosophy of nietzsche who said god is dead and there was no moralistic universe and there were existentialism existentialist philosophers who propounded their theories of existentialism where they said that uh, man was bereft of all previous traditional mores of thought and traditional modes of uh, uh, well uh, philosophy all existent earlier philosophy had not been able to save man from the catastrophe of the two wars and hence uh, what was then the next thing that man had to rely on and uh, when you see uh, when in the myth of sisyphus uh it has been pointed out that man's quest man's action is futile and uh how does Camus, or how does how does albert Camus, or how does jean paul sartre uh look at life which forms uh many of the theoretical constructs of what the theater of the absurd was supposed to be we see that metaphysically on the plane of religion, on the plane of uh, philosophy, man didn't have any uh, nothing. They didn't have anything to fall back on. So uh, this was uh, a kind of trying to gather things up, trying to uh, you know laugh at once. Uh, well, uh, the condition that human beings were in uh, post-war and try to reconcile to the forces of destruction all around and survive if not with heroism at least with uh, that kind of cynical humor that there is nothing left to follow that there's nothing left to abide by and so we uh, when we come to uh, the theater of the absurd proper we see this was a European movement, which was uh, not only a movement in writing, uh, not only a movement in literature. There were various uh, surrealist painters, for example, Picasso and other uh, Dadaist painters, who were also writing plays and who were also painting. And uh, this was a movement, and they had sympathizers. The, I mean, uh, the, the surrealists uh, had sympathizers with the Dadaists and the Dadaists. And, uh, you know connections with the uh, with the people who were uh, practicing the theater of the absurd and uh, the visual representation of uh, the theater of the absurd uh, plays or uh, the, the the main uh, the psychology between uh, behind writing this these plays did match with what the surrealists felt life to be like and what the dadaists felt life to have been so you see, uh, there was this uh, kind of a belief that, well, in an absurd universe where nothing happens and where man's efforts are not rewarded, where man is cut off, okay, metaphysically and metaphorically and, of course, religiously and transcendentally from his basic roots, there is no meaning. It is useless. It is absurd. It is meaningless. Now, this meaninglessness, but I would say that there's a lot of meaning in meaninglessness because when we think about, when we, if we have read a few works by uh, the major dramatists of the absurd, we would see that uh, there is a lot of meaning that is being let out through the plays. And um, if, uh, you know, uh, well, uh, not only uh, was there a change of perception so far as uh, ideology was concerned, but there was also breaking the stereotypes of drama. There was no beginning, there was no middle, there was no end. So doing away with Aristotelian 
forms of uh, beginning and ending and uh, the concept of character, the concept of play, uh, mostly plays were anti-plays. Uh, then there was a mixture uh, in these plays of fantasy and, uh, well, uh, realism to an extent. And uh, there are certain writers of the absurd who are very realistic. One of them is Painter, though he has a different style, but uh, his plays are bounded in the, uh, with, in, with, uh, you know, in, the, in the ambit of re uh, realism. So, uh, yes, uh, we can say that, uh, well, when we are talking about the theater of the absurd, there are elements like if we are doing a way, say, for example, I'd make it more simple. Uh, I don't know if I'm able to explain myself properly, but if I'm doing away with all previous forms of referencing, if I'm doing away with all previous forms of uh, knowledge, and all bases of knowledge that had proved futile and useless, uh, all forms of uh, the, the belief in Christianity itself is nullified. And uh, there is no sustaining, there is no nurturing force. And God is dead. And it's a dead universe where, where nobody has anything to do. And there's nothing that uh, no efforts or no uh, actions are rewarded or even recognized for that instance. Uh, so what exactly? do we have what exactly do we have to qualify it as not being absurd in the theater of the absurd plays according to my title that what was absurd in the theater of the absurd or how far it was absurd i would say that the theater of the absurd relied on myth and ritual these were the two areas which uh, which could not have been uh, nullified hello can you hear me Yes, sir. Am I audible, Dr. Kundu? Yes, yes. yes you are. Dr. Kundu, am I audible? You are audible. Hello? You are audible. Am I audible, Dr. Kundu? Yes, yes, you are audible. Yes, I think I'm audible now. Yeah. So, uh, well, uh, as I was saying that, hello? Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Please remind me, please pin me when I'm not. Yeah. Of course. So as I was saying that myth and ritual were two important domains that the theater of the absurd artists tried to fall back on. And myth and ritual were important because they existed from uh, the time man existed. Man's existence came in. And along with this, we have those allegorical, archetypal, mythological, uh, fantastical, um, uh, you know, dimensions of our existence which come together and which offer some possibility of staying alive if not uh, you know believing in hope or justice or love or any other uh, you know well uh, qualifying ideals that had so long been prevalent and so uh, you see the theater of the absurd plays were rather uh, strange i will talk about two to three plays and i don't wish to make it a summary of the plays by any means, but I would definitely like to talk about, uh, start by talking about Ionesco's uh, called Soprano, where uh, you see uh, identity, one of the most important features of an absurd play is the question of identity. We human beings are all alone. Uh, what identity do we carry? And is our identity the same as perceived by others? We see that the host uh, and the guests, they, 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 they kind of uh, understand uh, where uh, they are. Because if in this play, if we follow minutely, uh, we will see how the guests who enter, uh, you know, Mr. Smith's flat, they are man and wife, but they have been traveling in a train and both of them realize that they live in the same room, in the same, they sleep on the same bed. They have been living on the same street. They have been living in the same house, on the same floor and in the same address for so many years. And they have a daughter with the same name, Alice. And so they must be man and wife so it is a very very ironical proposition to come to a conclusion that's very logical because the summing up of all these facts that they that they have been experiencing so long together does give us logic even though an absurd play says that there is no logic of course 
there is a lot of logic and then we see at the end how a uh, roles the the, the 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 kind of role playing takes that that takes place in the ball soprano is very surprisingly startling because of the maid who goes off and the maid is revealed to be a lover of the fireman and the fireman goes away and how uh, at the beginning of the play what happened the same conversation reverts back to the end so uh, because you see there is no uh, there is little or no linearity in uh, uh, an absurd play because the play has a circular structure it ends exactly where it begins which means that the, the concept of time is also problematized because if time were to be linear if time were to be progressive or uh, if if, it, if time revealed progression then of course the plays would be progressing but the mere fact that the ending is just like the beginning or the beginning is just like the ending and the same thing happens what happened at the end just as it as it happened at the beginning all these things try to make us understand that time itself is not progressing maybe it stands still or it is a uh, you know uh, it is a rounded circular structure which uh, which kind of deludes our uh, you know efforts so time the quest of time the question of identity in relation to time is very important we have the same concept of time we have the same concept of identity and we have the same concept of values uh, if they are values at all uh if uh, the fact that nothing happens will always be like that that nothing will happen we have the same thing in waiting for godo yes while uh, i've talked about this one play in relation to and there's a lot of gibberish uh in any absurd play before i go on to discussion of any other play i would like to talk about language the importance of language in any theater of the absurd plays what function does language do language is primarily for the purpose of communication but we see that in the theater of an absurd play uh, language goes beyond uh, communication it does not communicate it miscommunicates maybe sometimes it also happens that language is unable to communicate with words so we are left with gibberish we are left with nonsense we are left with sounds uh, uh, syllables and sounds which make no words but which just give out the audible quality of sound so how is that related to gaining information or knowledge or making a statement so what function does language perform in society in fact we see that language may not perform any function at all and that's very important one of the major features of uh, not all absurdist playwrights but definitely many of them and we have a close uh, link with nonsense words nonsense as a genre the clowning the, the the black humor that comes through clowning the the kind of uh, well callow humor that comes from things which have lost their original essence so humor is not really comic as i would want to mention it may be comic but then uh, humor is very very dark yeah yes it is very very dark there is a certain depth to which with which humor leads you on in any theater of the absurd play and that's very important because you see uh, the function of humor humor makes us not only laugh at our condition but also observe that uh, uh, fruitlessness behind our endeavor it kind of reminds us that uh, it is totally meaningless to go on trying it kinds of uh warns us that we mustn't uh be uh wanting to exercise our will power we mustn't be wanting to exercise uh human volition and if what happens if human volition stops uh there should be some amount of uh, you know uh, exercise of will power on the part of individuals but humor tries to show us how that can be extremely threatening in many of the plays we find this kind of humor prevailing and uh, yes language as i mentioned uh, there are uh, different dimensions that different plays offer uh, different playwrights have as i said their own unique style and uh, again by an ionesco if we see the play the leader what happens in this play there is a leader who when he does come before his people doesn't have a head so what do you say of a headless leader uh, the physical uh, the anatomical absence of a head 
on a human being uh, does it make him a human being at all doesn't he become a moron isn't he just a just a body without a head which means he may not have an identity he may be devoid of or he may have sold off his identity it is a on uh, it is a comment on politicians in totalitarian states or politicians who have uh, well uh, in uh, modern societies where everything is regulated by uh, pre requisite formulas uh, and you have to follow that set of paradigm before you become popular and the general uh, the general uh, quality of the masses in not understanding how a leader operates how a leader becomes famous and how a leader would really uh, like to project himself uh, before his audience so all these are questions which very sarcastically cynically surely uh, uh, they come out uh, theater uh, absurd play and when it does come out the readers have to read in between the lines and they have to be very specific to draw their own responses because the theater of the absurd plays don't give you explanations language is used very sparingly sometimes extremely sparingly we can also look at rhinoceros and inesco's play uh, rhinoceros because uh, uh, soon after i talk about uh, i'm very wary about the connection going off again sorry about it so i'll try just to hurry up a bit uh, if we if we think about rhinoceros uh, of inesco we again see how this play uh, in this particular play uh, though this is dominated by uh, i wouldn't say dominated is a wrong word i guess um, i would like to say how this was influenced the fascist movement uh, in european politics in the 40s and how it it really showed uh, the rise of hitler and mussolini coming and then coming to power and how people were inducted into that belief and faith even before understanding what they were getting in how and what they were getting inducted by you see uh, the very physical uh, the, the very fact of physical transformation of human beings turning to rhinoceroses is something which is very interesting ideologically as well because when we change ideologically we are not we are not uh, that is not visible but when we change physically uh, you see that that becomes very potent a message that becomes very uh, that becomes very eye catching and so um, it's very daring play in its execution i would say and it's superbly brilliant because of its, you know exercise uh, uh, dialogues for uh you know going on for two to three paragraphs sometimes for two to three pages about logic how logician the mathematician how logic the very word logic means uh, rational thought and rational thinking and rational argument and uh, how this argument how this thinking how uh, you know uh, well uh, rationality how logic is turned on its head you see how logic is totally nullified and how human uh logic and philosophy can be uh, absolutely uh, well uh, topsy turvy in a universe that makes no sense so once again uh, this play is uh, interesting not only for its uh, physical transformation and uh, the theme that goes behind it but also for uh, well inesco's use of language inesco's uh concepts of uh well logic and rationalism and uh, what and how human beings how they interact in a framed setup and how they behave while I'm here with inesco i have mentioned in my previous lecture the very famous play and that's one of my favorites therefore i keep on repeating that the the the, the, the difference between illusion and reality which is uh, i mentioned this just in my earlier lecture a while ago about Pirandello's six characters in search of an author and that's a wonderful play of the theater of the absurd but uh, it probably questions all areas of uh, an absurd uh, universe starting right from language starting right from the concept of time character rehearsal dialogue script uh, a finished play on the stage to the role of the director the role of the producer the role of the uh well uh, so called lead actors and lead actresses and so called character and how we delimits uh the actor in the face of the emerging uh, importance of the character and how the character has been marred absolutely uh in the script but how he has to come out alive and uh, well right away from the title till the end all these and how of course uh Uh, is it necessary that we have a stage 
play at all? Is it necessary that we do have a staged play at all? What if we're watching a performance and we're not knowing about it is something, uh, a very important question that comes out from that play again, six characters in South an author. So, uh, and I would uh, like to uh, discuss uh, very hurriedly, very rapidly, uh, the plays by Jean Jure. You see, Jean Jure's life is very unusual, and uh, he was called thief. You know, he was on various several occasions. He was brought to the court of law for his uh, uh, stealing habits and. Uh, but that apart, you see, uh, in most of his plays, especially in three very interesting plays, uh, The Maids, which was published in 1947, uh, The Balcony, which was published in 1957, and uh, The Blacks, which was 1959, uh, performed. And, uh, sorry, I mentioned published, it should have been performed. Uh, you see, in the first play, uh, there is there is this uh, idea of uh, an absurd play and giving primacy to rituals. You see the maids, they perform a ritual every day. This ritual, and because I was talking about performance in the earlier lecture, let me tell you, this is a vibrant example of that. These two maids, Shalong and Claire, they are two sisters who are maids in a rich woman's house. They enact the role of the mistress and the maid. And uh, Shalong and Claire, they hate the mistress, but they act out to release their mental tension. At one point of time, we see they, one of them kills the other. The mistress is not killed, but uh, Shalong and Claire, while enacting the part of uh, the mistress and the servant, uh, because they harbored such ill feelings against the mistress, and they really wanted to kill her, they really wanted to hurt her. And so that thing actually takes place. So how a ritual can impinge on uh, real life and how that can really be dangerous and how uh, you know your subconsciousness can impinge and come out on the surface uh, to endanger your existence completely. And besides other facets of this play, I think The Maids is a wonderful example of a absurd play and it's at the same time a wonderful example of a play within the play the idea of performance and ritual taking place all at once and uh, all the features that go with uh, the theater of the absurd plays like repetitiveness like a circular structure like the idea of characters uh, worrying about their identity or not knowing their identity or uh, really cautious about uh, who they are why they are and uh, when they can where and when they can be and the the the, the centrality of time uh, the non-linearity of time you see time having a circular structure all these are there as well we come to another very important uh, jean Junet's plays and that is uh, well uh, since i'm hurrying up i'm going a bit fast as i said lee balkan or the balcony where uh, it is a portrayal of a macrocosm within a microcosm that is the balcony is actually named, uh, it is actually a brothel, which is a mini world. And uh, outside this brothel, there is a revolution going on. And what happens when the revolutionaries enter the brothel? The entire dynamics changes. Madame Arma, who is the leader of the brothel, she, uh, she allots roles, as she does in normal times as well. And we see how people assume multiple roles in this play, how and uh, how people change roles, how people assume multiple roles, and how people um, at the spur of moment, they have to change their orientation altogether and they become different individuals and they are a couple of different individuals all at once. Uh, there is a phrase which has been used with regard to Jean Genet, it is called All of Mirrors, and it aptly really is related to this play where Madam Irma's hall is actually made of mirrors and the reflection of one person standing there would lead to multiple innumerable reflections of the same person standing at different angles. So, and of course, this also explains the sensibility of uh, people uh, living uh, diverse lives. So, all of mirrors, apart from that ideological uh, framework, uh, the play itself is wonderful for a showcase of human behavior of uh, 
human frailties and how we uh, behave in, in terms of uh, when we are afraid, when we are, uh, you know, at gunpoint, how fear, uh, how does fear work itself out in our lives and how power uh, changes in relation to fear, how power changes in relation to political maneuvers, etc. cetera, a very important, politically very important and a very pertinent play for any political generation. And uh, then again, uh, another play of uh, Jean Genet, I would like to mention is The Blacks, which was you know, performed in uh, 1959. And this is again interesting because this play, uh, you see uh, more than any other uh, theater of the absurd playwrights, I, I think there might be many, which I'm not aware of right now. Uh, this play more than, uh, in fact, I, I, I felt this was very interesting about the play that it cuts across questions of gender, race, ethnicity, and it cuts across the idea of representationality. Uh, what is representation? What, what, what is representation? What is uh, your representative choice and what is your performative choice? Because I'm talking about this word performative choice because you see uh, the blacks as the name signifies is full of uh, black people uh, in the part of whites because the blacks have put on masks, white masks to project themselves as white. And there are certain white characters who have worn masks which are black and they want to project themselves as black. But that is not what is important. What is important is how have the characters approx been approximated into what they are not? How have the blacks integrated themselves or how have they been amassed by a rather, uh, you know, ruling white ideology? Or how has the white been able or uh, at a vantage point when a white man wants to project uh, himself as a black? He, how, what, what, what ideological changes does he offer uh, in trying to behave as a black? And what are, what are the finer shades of uh, you know, motivation behind doing so? And that is very important because uh, one of the themes that the play deals with is how a white woman is murdered. Her coffin is right there in the center of the stage. And by the end of the play, there is a court which has been set up and there are questions about how and who would be punished, whether it is the black and white. So this uh, you know, conflict at the intersection of race, gender, ethnicity, something which is very interesting. And uh, way back in those times, uh, well, uh, when there was uh, the great migration taking place in America, uh, and of course, uh, well, the second phase of the Great Migration was going on, and perhaps, uh, you know, uh, black black Americans were moving back uh, from the rural centers to the urban centers. They may have been, uh, you know, finer shades of uh, well, uh, migration and uh, you know, uh, relocating the center of consciousness, which which is a which was a historical phenomenon, and which uh, which is very well reflected in Jean Genet's plays. And I find that extremely fascinating. Besides these three plays, I think uh, there is his very wonderful a thesis journal, which is an autobiographical ac account of Jean Genet's life. And uh, there are, of course, many serial accounts of how he, when he was a, a prisoner in Metre prison, how he met uh, people and how uh, the prisoners, because they wanted to do away with boredom, had actually been playing at homosexuality and they were trying to. Uh, there is this very wonderful logical uh, kind of, uh, you know, reflection uh, in the Metre prison and how Jean Genet came uh, into confrontation with homosexuality for the first time in his life over there and how this has been made into a beautiful, uh, you know, shades of uh, play acting scenes, uh, little isolated scenes of play acting, which then surface as a larger, uh, as a components of a larger unit. So uh, Jean Genet, as a theater of the absurd playwright, has much to offer in his works. We wouldn't say that his plays are absurd at all. They are not at all absurd so far as comprehensibility is concerned. They're not at all absurd so far as uh, well language is concerned, or you know, so far as events and situations are concerned, so far as uh, conclusions and beginnings are concerned. So that is one very important aspect. 
I would also like to talk about and maybe wind up my lecture uh, with a little talk on Harold Pinter as a playwright of the absurd. Uh, you see, Harold Pinter's plays were once again in the realistic model, in the realistic mold, I should say. I'm not uh, sorry for using the word model. I would rather use the word mold because his plays within this realistic mold was trying to explore how menace, which is uh, one of the unavoidable uh, facts of our life, intrudes at any point in time. And so his plays are called the comedies of menace. His style is very different. And as you all must be knowing it, he's, his writings are called Pinterest because they by themselves have that peculiar uh, well style. But then I, I, I find two to three plays which are very intriguing and which uh, is not only about physical uh, dimensions of violence and which is not about menace and uh, the physical uh, ramifications of menace beyond and between uh, operating beyond and between our existence and when somebody else comes in. Yes. I would like to talk about such ways of painter where menace, when, when they do intrude, comes as something which is unforeseen, unexpected, uh, unrevealed, and how that changes the entire life of a character, as in the very first play, The Room. We have plays like The Homecoming, where uh, Ruth and Teddy, a couple, come home, and Ruth has to negotiate a whole menage of men. And she realizes that she would put on a different role apart from the wife, being simply the wife of Teddy. And so she changes the household, and the household gets transformed by her. This is a, this is a interdependent kind of uh, a dynamics, which is very difficult to uh, well, uh, discover and, uh, you know, well, uh, comment on. And uh, many critics and many writers of the play feel that Ruth has a role which is a very, very unbecoming of a wife. She plays the, the role of a prostitute to the male members, but it's not so. It's discovering yourself at a moment in time. As a critic myself, uh, because when everybody, everybody here is a critic, even the students who are listening to me, your scholars in your own right. When I'm reading a play, I become a critic of that play. And so from that point of view, I feel that Ruth has discovered herself anew. She had not only discovered herself, but maybe she, uh, she kind of gets transformed herself. And in that moment of transformation, a decision to leave Teddy and stay back behind with the family she never knew is something which is not only absurd, uh, I wouldn't say it is absurd either, but it is something which is uh, trying to explore your own identity once again, because our identities keep changing, they're not constant. They keep changing with time, they keep changing with circumstances, they keep changing with situations. And so that's it. There are plays by Pinter which reveal uh, the power dynamics in a state which uh, operates with force and which brings its uh, well, its individuals, its citizens to become law-abiding citizens by virtue of force. And one such play that I can recall is the Hot House, which within the sphere of an office space executes its members as in how they wish to, depending on whether the the office, uh, uh, the job holder fulfills the criteria or not. And there are more serious plays by Pinter like Mountain Language, which shows how, how uh, refugees are treated and which is very pertinent to our present political situation and how well uh, people who are uh, lower uh, on the rung of the ladder, how they uh, are treated and how, they, how their sufferings, how their position is violated each time they try to project themselves as citizens. So the very idea of you know, people being citizens, and that is very potent in today's, what is happening around the world right now? I think that is a very pertinent question that Pinter way back when he had written. Uh, there are reflections, these snippets of ideas that can come up and make us think. And I think that is very, very important as to how plays relate to our present situation. and. 
uh, we can see how uh, state engineer violence, state author uh, mandated, state authorized uh, tortures can take a tremendously uh, dangerous toll and uh, on people's lives, on people's mental make. And uh, that is there besides very uh, serious and thought provoking family dramas by Pinter. Uh, I would also like to talk about Pinter's memory plays and um, why I would like to talk about Pinter's memory plays and before I wind up is because uh, Pinter's memory plays here, the physical manifestation of violence is not something that we can see. There's nothing physical in violence. It's all mental. It's all psychological. I mean, it's within you. It's your subconscious including into your present state of existence and how the subconscious memory can be at the same time releasing and at the same time it can be dangerous because it, it can assure you to be the different person you believed yourself to be. And we have two very important plays in this direction. One is a landscape and one silence. Landscape about the husband and wife who's been long estranged but who live out their lives because they go back to memory and they play memory games and they enact memory games once again in the present uh, play. And uh, how at the end they realize that they can always stay together but only through uh, their memory because everything between them has ended and when we come to this play silence which is more of a monologue than a play uh, by painter in silence we see three characters who are so shady who are so shadowy and who are so uh, unformed that they seem like you know uh, you know your uh, people from your feverish imagination. Sometimes uh, what happens to us when we are there in an empty room, when, when, when uh, say for example, we are there in the house, but there's, there's no other family member around and we try to think about our own consciousness. Sometimes our own consciousness takes our present state of mind and uh, we go back to our consciousness when we are alone. And it's like, uh, three characters coming out from your memory and then going and receding back into your memory. Ramsey, Ellen and Bates, these are the three characters in silence and how they talk to each other, how they interconnect, how they relate and disconnect. And then again, they go back to from where they have emerged, maybe from the most, most inner recesses of your mind or consciousness. So this is very, very interesting. And I think that uh, though I wouldn't say it was uh, fully inspired by Proust, but yes, of course, uh, many critics have talked about Proust in relation to Pinter's memory plays. And so to wind up, uh, I would like to comment that the theater of the absurd was uh, a very, very, uh, a tremendously enormous body of work, which uh, if not enormous, was certainly varied in its approach to absurdity or the absurdities that surrounded man's life in the post-war phase and how uh, characters were not at all absurd, situations were not at all absurd. And if they were, there was a solid logical foundation to this absurdity. And so uh, this was, these were plays and these were, well, novels that, uh, that fully kind of uh, reflected the mental state of, uh, the people around the globe at that point of time because if we see the uh, social scenario these were times which were indeed difficult because uh, theater censorship was abolished in 1968 making it possible for uh, theaters to put up such unconventional plays and far back uh, in the 50s you see uh, there were other movements which uh, you know nothing emerges out of the blue if if you just say that the theater of the absurd was an absurd movement that started all of a sudden out of the blue it would be wrong you see the mainstream theaters the, the, the play the the act of writing the play is something else and when we talk about the theaters where these plays are performed and that is a different history altogether in britain by the side of mainstream uh, east uh, mainstream western theaters we have the rise of the provincial theaters we have the rise of the in britain and elsewhere of course uh, we have the rise of uh, the community theatres, we have the rise of the repertory theatres, the regional theatres, and all these theatres together, you see, performed these unusual plays, and uh, these, this, this kind of a theatre was because not all plays were seen by, uh, you know, all kinds of people. There were uh, exceptionally avant-garde groups of students and writers and thinkers 
and painters and uh, groups of uh, politicized uh, citizens and men across uh, states and countries who used to come together, uh, you know, meet in Paris. And they used to explore the theatrical idiom in their own way. And so the history of the theater runs parallel to the history of writing of dramas. And that's also very important when we try to see uh, how uh, the theater of the absurd and where and how and where they, uh, you know, staged their plays. And this is something which is interesting as well. And uh, uh, there were the students' riots of 1968 and the students' revolt, not riot, but yes, of course, in some places it took the dimension of rioting. Uh, and the students' revolt is a landmark uh, in the history of human civilization and the history of European politics and how that influenced. Because for the first time, and we have a reflection of that in Painter's plays as well, uh, how that is reflected uh, in literature in such, such plays and how um, how uh, plays were being performed and written which were uh, more into the lives of the people they wanted to project. And so I don't think that it is an absurd phenomenon at all, though it died down and it was very short-lived for two decades. Uh, the theater of the absurd uh, playwrights continued writing plays and nonetheless, even if their plays were not bordered, uh, bordering on the absurd, they definitely had a point to make. And uh, of course, uh, the genre didn't die out because we still have the dystopian novel, we still have the fantasy novel, we still have magic realism. And when we talk about absurd as a genre, it doesn't only emerge all of a sudden, as I said when I began, it takes its inspiration from the finer shades of psychoanalysis, the, the theory of psychoanalysis. Uh, it took its inspiration from the existential writers, it took its inspiration from the, well, expressionist directors in films and who were writing film scripts and it took its inspiration from surrealist painters so it was a, a very integrated and a very wide formed well formed uh, you know widely researched and widely thought out movement and uh, we wouldn't do the mistake of thinking that it existed in isolation at all and uh, when you consider the play's qualities, the thematic qualities of the theater of the absurd, or uh, the, 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 the questions of language, the questions of messaging of the plays, there isn't any message. There is no dramatic conflict in the theater of an absurd play, because if it is a dramatic conflict, then there has to be something that comes out of it. But we don't expect that, that because nothing ever happens, because there's a sense of nihilism, there's the sense of nothingness. So all this is very much related uh, and not definitely absurd. And uh, uh, this lecture was a series of uh, reflections which I wanted. And there might be a thousand more examples which I could uh, supplement with. And uh, if not, a few more at least to, uh, to help explain. But I would uh, like to say that, yes, of course, uh, reading uh, Samuel Beckett reading Pinter, reading N.F. Simpson, uh, reading, uh, well, Edward Albee and uh, reading Ionesco and Jean Junet uh, would give students some ideas about uh, how the theater of the absurd playwrights were uh, wanting to express what they did. Thank you so much for your patience here. Are you there, Dr. Kundu? Yes, yes uh, I'm thank done. you, for this uh, enlightening talk uh, on absurd theater, theater. So uh, next we have another Hello? session. Uh, yes, I'm out of the. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. I'm done with my lecture. Uh, yes. Thank you so much. Okay. If there are we'll any questions, I will. Yes, uh, we'll take them. Uh, it's from Dawabhat Adhikari. Yes, definitely. Uh, that is one of the attempts that uh, the they shock us out of our sensibility. They do, uh, you know, shake us out of complacent lives. And uh, with regard to your question, I would like to say I think that was a point I missed. Uh, well, and that fits in with what you asked. Uh, uh, the theater of the absurd was very much uh, indebted to various sources, which I already mentioned. Then it was also. Uh, indebted to one particular play by Antonin Artaud, and that was Ebehua. Ebehua, where Hua the king tortures 
because it's a puppet play. So you see how puppetry comes in. It's a puppet play which shocks us as to how the king uh, Ebehua tortures his citizens and then kills them and massacres them. And this is a general genocide. Yes, of course, uh, the outer sphere, how uh, the absurdity of lives, they not only uh, come to our lives, but go beyond the outer space as well. I think uh, that is that was a really good observation. Thank you. See, existentialism, thank you, uh, Shiva Jyoti. Uh, uh, existentialism is a philosophy which uh, was propounded by uh, Albert Camus and, uh, well, Jean-Paul Sartre. They believe that existence uh, was regulated by certain factors. And uh, you see, uh, what was the existential philosophy basically tried was dependent on nihilism was dependent on uh, this uh, post war nothingness and this kind of uh, you know uh, negation of uh, all activity uh, and uh, as i mentioned human uh, the role of human volition is absent and uh, well uh, they were sympathizers with the movement of the theory of the absurd yes of course there was and uh, the theory of the absurd the theater of the absurd closely relied and they had uh, they had taken from that philosophy. If you see uh, many of the plays where uh, the world is an existential world, okay, which is like the myth of Sisyphus, Sisyphus moving the boulder up the hill and a mythological char character condemned to eternal, uh, uh, you know, perdition where uh, the, the, the boulder rolls down and he has to go up and, uh, you know, carry it up again and then again it comes down. So this existential philosophy uh, of the futility of human existence uh, bordering on futility i think that is there yeah okay Dee. Uh, as i can see there are uh, no more questions okay thank you so much uh, dr kundu Okay, uh, then, so uh, we will end this session uh, with a formal vote of thanks. And for that, uh, I request uh, our student Nisha Mahapatro uh, for the. Am I audible? Yeah, you're audible. Okay, ma'am. So, a very good evening to one and all present here. So, let me first introduce myself. So, I, Nisha Mahapatro, student of UG fifth semester, Department of English, Midnapur College, Autonomous. On behalf of my whole department, I would like to extend a very hearty vote of thanks to the Honorable Delegate, Dr. Pinky Isha, Assistant Professor of English, RBU Kolkata, for her wonderful lecture. Thank you so much, ma'am, that you have blessed us with your presence today. And we all have enjoyed your lecture. Secondly, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to our respected principal, sir, Dr. Gopal Chandra Bera for organizing this wonderful lecture series and making our lockdown period really a significant one. Thirdly, I would like to express my gratefulness uh, to my respected professor, Mr. Tonmay Gundu, sir, for making this session really a grand success. And last but not the least, I would also thank my dear participants across India for actively cooperating with all of us. So thank you. Stay safe. Uh, thank you, Nisha. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Professor Beira. Thank you, Dr. Kundu. Thank you so much uh, for your patient you. hearing. Okay. Thank you, Dee. Hey, Tanma, you have to listen to me? Yes, I have Are you still live? Yes. Uh, okay, the thing is that I do not have my micro or headphone with me. So... Whatever the laptop microphone so, can do. Uh, uh, so yes. Okay. Yes, join. Let us ask him to switch on the camera as well as unmute himself. Oh, hello, sir. <laughs> hello. Hello. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> 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 
How are you all? Hello. 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 online lecture series and we are today joined by a renowned academician uh, dr gautam budu siral of bangalore university who will be speaking on uh, the character of marco today now it is uh, i consider this to be my good fortune to have the opportunity of introducing him <coughs> formally he is my direct teacher someone uh, who has mentored me and whatever i am today is majorly because of him he has been a guide not only an academic guide but also someone who um, has taught me the values of life so if there is any student of mine who is listening to this so look at this man from whom i have learned um a lot of what uh, i teach you today and i tell you today so um i am going to try to introduce him formally and uh, but uh, that's just a formal part of my introduction um the connection that you have with him is majorly an emotional one we go back uh, almost like 24 years um so as i said that from the very beginning of uh, my um, you know uh, stay with english honors he has been there and he's still there and will be there whenever i am in any kind of confusion i um, without any hesitation ring him up and he always guides me so it's um, a blessing on my part to have him as my mentor and teacher um i'm saying this with emphasis today because uh, these days we are um, many a times facing a problem with uh, the concept of teachership the relation between the teacher student is uh, again uh, under some kind of jeopardy but uh, dr gautam budu siral whom i have always affectionately called sir um he has stood like a beacon for me for many of us Uh, so anyway that's my emotional side i should not let that go on for any length of time because i could go on like that for you know minutes together so let me try to introduce him formally professor gautam budu siral is professor department of english bakura university he has been teaching since 1990 he started his career as a teacher in bakura e christian college in the department of english he went to bristol university in united kingdom in 2006 as a visiting fellow In 2008 he joined the department of english vidyasagar university mitnapur as a professor a year later in 2009 he came back to his old college and continued to teach there until july 2015 he is the author of a book hopkins and pre raphaelitism and has edited four books on tribal life he has presented papers in various conferences and seminars and a number of his papers have been published in different national and international journals and books his area of interest is victorian poetry indian english literature and tribal and dalit studies so here i now request him formally to deliver his talk entitled marco in the guide more sinned against than sinning sir thank you thank you so much rikot uh let me formally thank uh, the department of english ug and pg midnapur college and uh, thank you also to the respected principal of uh, the college professor bera uh, what soikot uh, told about me is definitely uh, very moving for me definitely and uh, i feel really moved uh, because whenever there is a tribute from a student like soikot it uh, moves a teacher no doubt about it uh, but i i i doubt whether i deserve that kind of uh words that he said about me anyway uh my best wishes to people on the other side i hope that uh, mostly people on the other side are our students so i will uh, take only i think uh, 30 35 minutes to deliver my talk and uh, as uh, you know that uh, i have uh, titled my paper just one minute uh
yes. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, title my paper. You can uh, you you already have an idea about that because the poster was there for a long time. Uh, Marco in the guide, more sinned against than sinning. Uh, basically, what I'll be doing today is a very close analysis of the text, and I will be referring to the text uh, time and again to prove whatever I will be saying today. Right. I begin with an observation by Martin Chilton, right? Uh, his words in one of his articles, which is uh, posted on 13th May 2020 on the Penguin webpage. The title is Why R.K. Narayan's Fiction is the Perfect Lockdown Escape. And as I said, it is available on the Penguin webpage. Uh, he says, these are the words. I have found myself thinking about Malgudi again during coronavirus lockdown, imagining the bustling marketplace full of jabber and babble and the joy of a place without politicians or traffic. It's pleasurable to daydream about sitting under one of Malgudi's palmyra trees, munching a thali platter and watching one of the colorful carnivals. Malgudi is where we all belong and where we wish we lived, said Narayan. And it is pointed out as a sovereign kind of a thing under the title that also I have quoted Timeless and consoling, the hugely popular Indian author's novels based in the fictional town of Malgudi make for reassuring destination, right? The setting of Narayan's novel, The Guide, is also Malgudi. But uh, in my talk today, I am concerned with the portrayal of Marco, as my title says, one of the major characters of the novel. In the guide, Marco is a person about whom the words of Shakespeare in King Lear seem to fit very appropriately, at, at least that is my reading of the character. He appears to me as one who is more sinned against than sinning. Marco has been variously described by critics and readers of the guide, and most of them, needless to say, expressed their disapproval of the character. Marco appears to them dominant and insensitive. He is unsympathetic and oppressive to his wife. He is impractical and obsessed with his academic pursuits. All this is because Narayan, the novelist himself, wanted to present Marco in a negative light to portray the protagonist more effectively, perhaps. Nandini Bhattacharya, in her book, R.K. Narayan's The Guide, New Critical Perspective, says, Marco, perhaps, has been the most undervalued and neglected character in The Guide. His real name is not mentioned, and we are made to swallow a second-hand portraiture of Marco. He is not permitted to represent himself in the novel. Raju is entrusted by the novelist with the task of introducing him to the readers. And since the very beginning, Raju thinks and talks negatively of Marco. It is again Raju who invents a name for the character and Christens him Marco. It is difficult to guess whether with his informal education Raju was aware of the association of such a great name. But even if he knew about the great explorer Marco Polo, his nicknaming of Rosie's husband was not without the satirical steam to make him appear ridiculous to the reader for his interest in archaeological subjects. 
Narayan allows Marco minimum space in the novel. Among a total of 11 chapters in the book, he appears only in two chapters, chapters five and seven. He is introduced to the readers in chapter five through Raju. And while introducing Marco, Raju at the very outset makes it clear that he dislikes the man. He hastens to add that he was a very strange man who did not always care to explain what he was doing. This strangeness, we come to know a little later, is principally due to his academic enthusiasm, which Raju failed to appreciate. Marco came to Malgudi not on a honeymoon trip with his wife, but to carry out his archaeological explorations, which were his uppermost concern during the visit. It is quite natural that Raju, with his little learning, would find Marco a man of altogether different frequency. On his arrival at Malgudi, Marco shortly got busy with his studies of cave paintings and carvings on Mempi Hills. He left Rosie to please herself the way she liked. Almost immediately after Rosie arrived at Malgudi, she asked Raju if he could take her to a snake charmer who could make a snake, in fact, a cobra, dance to the tune of his flute. Marco did not object to her plan. He only said, if it interests you, you can make your own arrangements. Don't expect me to go with you. I can't stand the sight of a snake. This is what Marco said. And you can see on the screen what is impression, what is the impression of Gafur and Raju about the snake dance. I'm coming to that. Marco's reaction was quite common and natural. Both Gafur, the taxi driver, and Raju expressed almost the same reaction. Gafur felt surprised and even annoyed. Why should anyone want to come so far to see a reptile? As the snake dancing continued, Raju said, the whole thing repelled me, but it seemed to fascinate the girl. Raju's infatuation for Rosie was instant and his dislike for Marco was equally instantaneous. Raju expresses his disapproval of Marco the moment he refuses to accompany Rosie for the snake dance. I disliked this man, he says. He was taunting such a divine creature. My sympathies were all for the girl. She was so lovely and elegant. Obviously, the emphasis is added by me. You can see divine creature, so lovely and elegant. These are the phrases. And we know that Raju's infatuation for Rosie was, as I have said, instantaneous. At this point, let us remember the fact uh, <clears throat> that uh, Rosie arrived a day or two later than Marco at Malgudi, and she was received at the station by Marco. Had he not been a caring husband, he could have entrusted Raju to do the job. In fact, Raju feels annoyed for not being asked to do such a pleasant task. I quote from the text. These are Raju's words. Her arrival had been a sort of surprise for me. The man was the first to appear. I had put him up at the Anand Bhavan Hotel. After a day of sightseeing, he suddenly said one afternoon, I must meet the Madras train. Another person is coming. He didn't even stop to ask me what time the train would arrive. He seemed to know everything beforehand. He was a very strange man who did not always care to explain what he was, what he was doing. So Raju's disapproval of Marco right from the start was due to the fact that unlike most of the tourists coming to Malgudi, Marco didn't seek his, seek his help as a guide. He was already having some prior information of the place as he was coming with a specific purpose that I've already mentioned, to study the paintings and carvings in the caves of Mempi Hills, a project that he had undertaken as an archeological researcher. 
By Raju's own admission, he often used to cheat his customers who were not aware of the history of Malgudi. At times, of course, things were different and he had to swallow the snubbing of well-informed tourists for baffling them. But the case of Marco was a unique one as his dependence on Raju as a guide was minimal. In Raju's own words, the man did not even care to tell me anything about himself or where he wanted to go on the following morning. An extraordinary fellow. Raju himself confesses that his role was reduced to that of a taunt by Marco and his reaction was strong. He says, a hateful fellow, I had never hated any customer so much before. The reader feels that Raju's feelings towards Marco stem not just from dislike, but from hatred. Judged from this angle, it is quite natural that any account that Raju would provide of Marco would be colored by his strong feelings of antagonism towards that man. Here precisely, the reader questions the authorial intention. Does Marco deserve to be hated? Why does the author choose Raju's agency to describe Marco in such a negative manner? Is it because such a method helps the author to depict Marco as a stubborn and cold-hearted character so that his decision to dump his wife at Malgudi, fend for herself, might find justification? The issue may be debated by the readers. Marco is a man of pronounced likes and dislikes. He may appear idiosyncratic, but a single decision he takes, not a single decision he takes, he takes them impulsively or whimsically. The marriage between him and Rosie did not take place in Hest or suddenly. On Rosie's side, her family discussed in detail the pros and cons of such a negotiation. Rosie says, I quote, we had had many discussions before coming to a decision. All the women in my family were impressed, excited that a man like him was coming to marry one of our class. And it was decided that if it was necessary to give up our traditional art, it was worth the sacrifice. It is clear that Rosie and her family did not take a momentary decision in respect of the marriage. And as if uh, that was, uh, 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 sorry, uh, yes, it is clear that Rosie and her family did not take a momentary decision in respect of the marriage. And as it appears from Rosie's words, that the family was ready to make Rosie give up dancing if that was placed as a precondition for such a marriage. The reader has to remember that Rosie herself did not disagree on this point. On the other hand, talking about her engagement with Marco, Rosie tells Raju, I quote, well, we met. He examined me and my certificates. We went to a registrar and got married. Here also I have added my emphasis on my certificates. It is clear from Rosie's words that the marriage was duly legalized, though not perhaps celebrated socially, and Marco satisfied himself about Rosie's intellectual accomplishments before entering into a marital relationship. The advertisement for the bride also made it clear that the bachelor was of academic interests. Rosie, equipped with a postgraduate degree in economics, was expected to understand the implications of all this. What rather surprises the reader is that, being so highly qualified, remember the days, it was definitely a qualification, which can easily be termed high, under the word high, high highly qualified. So is that, uh, uh, is, is that being so highly qualified, she never for once evinces any academic inclinations in her behavior and shows almost no interest in the research work that Marco does. She is no different from Raju in describing Marco's study of cave paintings and carvings as 
quote unquote wall gazing. If for Marco, Rosie's dance is quote unquote street acrobatics, then for Rosie, her husband's research activities are nothing more than gazing at, I mentioned this, this is from the text, cold, cold old stone walls. Marco was absolutely devoted to his own work. When he, he is absorbed in his work, he becomes totally oblivious of the outside world. This is the nature of a person dedicated to his mission and vision. Marco had the vision of, quote unquote, rewriting history. He ultimately published his work, The Cultural History of South India, which received great compliments from intellectual circles, as was evident from the review published in the Illustrated Weekly of Bombay, which wrote about the book, I again quote the single line, an epoch making discovery in Indian cultural history. <clears throat> Marco is described by Raju as impractical. Side by side, he is looked upon as a typical member of the patriarchy who is rather blunt and insensitive to the emotional needs of his wife. There is no denying the fact that much of these churches hold ground. We have been allowed a very small slice of Marco's life in the novel. The span for which he stays in Malgudi was barely two months. Definitely, <clears throat> he took a major decision of his life during this brief period, virtually going for a separation with his wife. It seemed that the conjugal life of Marco and Rosie had come to a deadlock where the wedlock would give way to divorce. The novel, of course, hints the opposite in chapter nine, <coughs> where the reader comes to know that at Marco's instance, the publisher sent a copy of his book to Raju, which is followed by a letter from Marco's lawyer to Rosie in connection with handing over of a jewelry box to Rosie. <clears throat> One can look at these gestures as meaningful, for these may be efforts on Marco's part to make a fresh start of their conjugal life. What strikes the reader is that in spite of the split between Marco and Rosie, for which Raju was instrumental, Marco did not forget his promise that he had met to Raju for his help during his research work at Malgudi. <clears throat> he acknowledged Raju in his book and sent him a copy of the book. Most criticism of Marco focus on his stony indifference to the dance of Rosie. But one has to remember that Marco married Rosie, ignoring the fact that she was a member of a family dedicated to temple dancing. At this point, readers may ask the legitimate question, <coughs> sorry, that if Marco knew the family background of Rosie and rose over the caste barrier in marrying Rosie, then why did he lay the precondition that Rosie would have to give up her dance in her post-marital life? The answer can be found in Rosie's words. She told Raju, I quote, I belong to a family traditionally dedicated to the temples as dancers. My mother, my grandmother, and before her, her mother. Even as a young girl, I danced in our village temple. You know how our caste is viewed. We are viewed as public women. Her words find corroboration in what Dr. Jukka O. Mietinen of the Theatre Academy of Helsinki wrote. This is available on the net. I quote, during the British colonial period, the decline of the Devadashi institution into prostitution led to a censorship of temple dances, which were finally prohibited by law in the 1920s. At that time, Indian dance was seen by the educated classes as something vulgar and degenerated. This was partly because of the decline of the Devadashi system and partly because of the disp uh, despising attitudes of the colonial administrators. So does the association of Rosie with temple dancing possibly did not appear to Marco as respectable. 
the social stigma associated with it possibly prompted Marco to lay the precondition. In fact, in Rosie's own family, her elders themselves did not approve of a career of temple dancing for Rosie. Rosie tells Raju, a different life was planned for me by my mother. She put me to school early in life. I studied well. I took my master's degree in economics. Had Rosie been, at the time of her marriage, already an exponent of Bharat Natyanam, as we find her towards the end of the novel, who knows, Marco's attitude to her dancing could have been a different one. In fact, when Rosie danced before Marco in the pig house at Malgudi, he disapproved of her dancing by pointing out that she did not have proper training in that. This was true and can be seen reflected in the words of Rosie, who was planning to have proper theoretical knowledge of Bharatanatyam. In the words of Raju, if you read the text, you will find that Rosie, when she was planning for her future career after coming to Raju's place, she was thinking of this. I quote the words from the text. She would then spend an hour or two in the forenoon studying the ancient works of art, Nakta Shastra of Varat Muni, a thousand years old, and various other books, because without a proper study of the ancient methods, it would be impossible to keep the purity of the classical forms. All the books were in her uncle's house, and she would write to him to send them on to her by and by. She would also want a pundit to come to her to help her to understand the texts. As they were well written, as they were all written in an old terse style. And actually, she asked, you can see the question, can you get me a Sanskrit pundit? She asked. She asked to Raju, obviously. To consider Marco as an oppressing member of patriarchy, trying to suppress the freedom of Rosie, I think is not all true. Right from the moment when Rosie, on her arrival at Malgudi, wanted to see a cobra, till she confessed her promiscuous relationship with Raju, Marco did not object to whatever Rosie wanted to do. In fact, Rosie appeared quite independent and spirited lady when following her disagreement with Marco on the eve of going to the pig house on the very, uh, I think after she came on the second day, that was the plan to go to the pig house. So uh, <clears throat> she refused to accompany him to go to Mempi Hills and told Raju that I would have taken the next train home. That's what she said. But she was given go ahead by Marco, be it sitting out at on the sitting out the night with Raju at the veranda of Pick House or going down to the hotel with Raju to bring a few things she needed and subsequently spend her days mostly in the hotel downhill while Marco stayed back in Pick House to pursue his research work. It is difficult to agree. I have uh, all respect for uh, the great teacher Krishna Shin. She has got a book. You are all familiar with that. Uh, but here I would like to disagree with what she says. It is difficult to agree with Krishna Shin when she says, I quote, he, meaning Marco, is so unworldly that he unsuspectedly consigns Rogi to Rosie to Raju's care while he studies keep painting for weeks on end. This very critical observation <clears throat> stems from patriarchal bias. Does Sen think that a woman is a property and that too of Rosie's stature and MA in economics who can be handed down or transferred by one male to another? When the critic says this, she on the other hand takes it for granted that Rosie is a property of her husband about whom the husband can take any decision he likes. And on the other, the husband's unsuspecting nature, do you call it a demerit? Because this is said that he is so very unsuspecting. So he is unworldly. I doubt whether he is unworldly or inexperienced. And his unsuspecting nature, I think, is not a demerit. Again, Rosie, given the opportunity, can enter into extramarital relationship with Raju is also hinted at in this comment. In other words, 
such a comment presupposes that a married woman must be under the custody of the husband and the husband who lets his wife go with another person person shows his immaturity maybe you can point out that this is not in case of everybody but this is the case with marco the peculiar kind of man he was that's why i beg to differ rosie did play into the hands of raju who emotionally exploits her when sen says that marco represents in the book this is her words her criticism of marco's character an assimilated westernization it can well be countered by pointing out that marco rather presents a synthesis of indian tradition and westernization he does not want to throttle the wishes and desires of his wife but at the same time he cannot tolerate his wife who throwing all her dignity to the winds can go down to the level where she could dance before a tourist guide of almost no acquaintance in her hotel room <clears throat> the institution of marriage stands on the basis of mutual faith and trust if that faith or trust is lost the relationship becomes untenable sen points out that i quote again marco's dismay seems to stem from rosie's violation of the norms of marriage rather than from a sense of personal loss does it imply that had marco felt his separation from rosie as a personal loss he would have tolerated the violation of the norms of marriage and one cannot be sure whether for marco it is a personal loss or not as it is the creator of marco who did not allow him to say things for himself it is always raju who reports things about marco <clears throat> The guide depicts only a span of about two months in the life of Rosie and Marco that I have already pointed out. Details like when they got married or since how long they have been leading their marital life are not mentioned in the novel. Even if it is taken for granted that she had been suffering from an emotional void in her conjugal life, the immediacy with which she entered into a relationship with Raju, who was not more than a stranger, does not reflect her sagacity in less than a week's time of her arrival at malgudi she allowed raju to share her hotel room in fact on the very next day of her arrival following some disagreement with her husband she said as i have mentioned already that it was for raju that she did not leave malgudi and go back to her home when she says that i would have gone back home she also mentions that it was for raju that she stayed back that she changed her decision the most uh, marginalized major character in the novel is definitely marco the novel takes care to record the psychological upheavals of rosie in detail following her unsavory disclosure to marco about her relationship with raju whereas the reaction of marco who on hearing this is terribly shocked and spends a sleepless night does not find any expression in the novel marco takes the decision of not acknowledging his conjugal partner any more as his wife but the novelist does not allow any psychological probing into his character instead the way marco's reticence or reserve is portrayed in the novel makes him appear as an insensitive and unemotional and an unemotional mechanical personality while going for marriage he rode over the tradition and entered into a marital bond which the society at that time usually did not approve this illustrates the man's power and self confidence to swim against the tide and is seen as a positive quality but when he decides to leave behind his wife it is his rigidity which is criticized he said to rosie you go where you please or do what you please and then he says when rosie insisted on her still being his wife marco said you are here because i am not a ruffian but you are not my wife the man who went to the station to receive his wife and did not interfere in whatever she had been doing 
to keep herself in her own world was not disowning his wife because of her extramarital relation with Raju. Readers may sympathize with Rosie, who felt humiliated and feels distressed at her husband's rigid stand, but the feelings of Marco, who is also terribly shocked at his wife's unfaithfulness, escaped the ken of the readers as they were not allowed to be narrated. Perhaps he could never dream that Raju, who was accepted as a member of the family, I quote this phrase from the text, um, was accepted as a member of the family, could deceive him by trying to win away his wife from him. But the reader's sympathy goes with Rosie because the novelist wanted to present Marco as meanly unfilling to his wife. Towards the end of the novel, we find Rosie lamenting her decision in allowing Raju to dominate her life and complains that she has been exploited by Raju against her wishes. On the other hand, she felt sorry for her behavior towards her husband and wanted to make amends for that. Following the hiding of Marco's book by Raju, there ensued a rift between her and Raju and when Rosie wanted Raju to explain the reason for his action, Raju reminds her, and I quote from the text, don't you remember when and how he left you? Rosie's reply was, I do. I deserve nothing less. Any other husband would have throttled me then and there. He tolerated my company for nearly a month, even after knowing what I had done. So Rosie even went to the extent of pointing out that she felt tired of her, I quote from the text, the phrase, circus existence, and would try to reunite with her husband, who she hoped would accept her if she stopped dancing. In conclusion, it may be said that Marco has got many positive points in his character. He is a man of determination and integrity. He did not forget to acknowledge his debt to Raju in helping him study the Mempi Cape pictures. But again, this is the man, same man, who brought the charge of forgery against Raju on the basis of which Raju had to suffer two year imprisonment. This is not a contradiction in his character, but only confirms the fact that he is a man of principle. While he shows magnanimity to acknowledge the contribution of a tourist guide in the making of his epoch-making book, he is not to brook the forgery that Raju resorted to. In fact, it is very difficult to judge the character of Marco impartially, as the readers of the guide are always meant to look at this character through the two specs that Narayan provides us or provides them. One is Raju and the other is Rosie. As I conclude, I'd like to quote the words of Nandini Bhattacharya, the book that I've already mentioned. She says, in Raju's discourse, Marco appears apparently as a sinister villain, a monster, an expert tormentor of his wife and Raju. But the unbiased reader will be able to notice many positive points in this peculiar man. So Marco may be a peculiar man, man a unique personality, but he definitely is not a villain. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, I have done. Thank you, sir. And um, for me, it is more like revisiting the old days, but in the process. And uh, maybe I should not go on eulogizing so much on a light no. platform, but it was so reassuring to listen to a voice which has uh, always been um, a very, very pleasurable experience for me. So uh, maybe I should stop here. I've been going a little uh, emotionally with this introduction today. Um, so uh, formally, thank you, uh, Professor Sural, for your illuminating uh, talk and uh, uh, analyzing the text so closely which is a way of study that many a times we um, do not pay adequate attention to. Um, now is the time for uh, the questions. Uh, I would ask our uh, 
coordinator of the PG department, uh, PG wing of our department, Tom Maikundu, to make visible the questions that have been posted either on Facebook or on YouTube. One question sir, already is on your screen. Hmm. What roles do karma and dharma play in the AC? In the, in the book, actually, in the novel, The Guide by Arke Narayan. Yes. Karma and dharma, uh, uh, this is towards the end of the novel, when Raju actually was facing uh, the threat of imprisonment, and he was imprisoned, actually. Uh, Rosie pointed out that this is all his karma, which has ultimately uh, made him see these days, these hard days. So naturally, yes, definitely, you can find a kind of uh, a relationship between karma and dharma, because uh, yes, at the end, uh, there is actually a kind of uh, uh, elevation of Raju's character. Uh, when the novel begins, we find him at the a new in, in his new role, the sadhu in the temple, in the temple. But uh, as the novel comes to a close through the narration of his past life, what we find is that Raju, the fake man, possibly is allowed by Narayan, a kind of elevation. Finally, the novel ends in an open manner. It is an open-ended novel. Uh, Raju perhaps dies, but uh, at the same time, through his death, Raju pays possibly for the misdeeds that he uh, committed during his life. That's how I look at it. <clears throat> Yes, this is Samrita. Sir, I just have one question. Why didn't Marco arrange for a formal training for Rosie's dance, despite his knowledge that she was not formally trained? Raju very much did that. Yes, yes. Yes, I agree. I agree that that would have been done or that, that should have been done by Marco. But then uh, this was uh, actually uh, uh, the demerit, and you can say, because I have acknowledged also that uh, much of the criticism against Marco hold grounds. Uh, there is no doubt that he is a man of rigid character. When he said no, he meant a no. Uh, that may be a negative trait in his character because uh, if we go back to the same thing, the premarital precondition that you should forego dance, then possibly she was reminded of that. And uh, I think I know. I don't know whether. How far I am uh, uh, relevant here to mention the fact that uh, after I wrote an essay on Marco's character, much to this line, what I have uh, told you today, it was published in a book. And then uh, a year later, perhaps, I got a letter from a doctor in South India. He was by profession a doctor, right? And uh, <clears throat> I, unfortunately, I could not trace the letter. Otherwise, I would have quoted from the letter. What he said in that letter was very interesting. He was a medical man. And he raised the point that, uh, why do you think that uh, Rosie immediately on alighting from the train want, wanted to see the dance of a cobra? And then he explained that it was possibly Marco was sexually important because he refers to a medical term which is venous lick which refers to if you consult the dictionary you will in dictionary you will find that uh, venous lick refers to the erectile dysfunction of the male sex organ so naturally uh, rosie possibly was not satisfied and Rosie's inclination to snake dance, Rosie's inclination to uh, Varatnatyam, whatever you may say, was possibly a reminder to, to, to Raju, sorry, to, to Marco of his important condition, right? So that may be uh, a, a reason why he did not uh, like Rosie to continue her dancing career and uh, why she did not, uh, as you say, that arranged for the training of Rosie as, uh, so that she can develop as a uh, Varatanaktam dan dancer, full-fledged and trained, right?
was Rosie's Rosie's dance? <laughs> sorry, Rani. Yes, welcome. Was Rosie's dance the acid test of? Uh, sorry, Marcos. Please, please show me. Hi, right. test of liberal patriarchy. Uh, yes, to some extent, definitely, because the novel could have ended in a different way, as Samrita has pointed out, if Marco would have made uh, made an arrangement for Rosie's training, and Rosie, as a consequence, developed as a trained dancer. Then you, I, I, I think uh, the, the question that you have put uh, would have been squarely answered that, 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 that could represent liberal patriarchy, right? But then unfortunately, uh, Rosie developed his career as a dancer, but fell in wrong hands because Raju ultimately proved a cheat. <clears throat> Yes. <coughs> Apparently, sir, as Tonmo is posting nothing more, I believe that uh, those were the questions that were posted by our listeners. Um, so I would now like to request Nisha Mohapatro, a student of our uh, UG department, UG fifth semester, formally offer the vote of thanks but before um, nisha begins a vote of thanks let me personally thank you sir for thank you thank you uh, <laughs> and it was so good to see see you and listen to you uh, like thank this you. not uh, maybe in better times we're going to meet again okay, okay sir. yes yes sure sure thank nisha, you please go ahead am i audible sir yes you are. okay sir so a very good evening to one and all present here so let me first introduce myself. Uh, I am Nisha Mahapatru, student of UG 5th SEM, Department of English, Mirnapur College Autonomous. So on behalf of my whole department, I would like to extend a very hearty vote of thanks to the Honorable Delegate, Dr. Gautam Buddhasural, Professor of English, Bankura University, for his wonderful and mesmerizing lecture. Thank you so much, sir, that uh, you have blessed us with your presence today. And it has been really a wonderful experience for all of us. And we are fortunate enough that we got the opportunity to hear you. So thank you so much, sir, once again. Uh, I'm equally thankful me. to you for giving me this opportunity to meet you. Yes, thank you. It's, it's my pleasure, sir. <laughs> Secondly, I would like to express my uh, sincere gratitude to my respected principal, sir, Dr. Gopal Chandra Bera, for organizing this lecture series and making our lockdown period really a significant one. Thirdly, I would like to express my gratefulness to my respected professors, Mr. Tonmoy Kundu, sir, and also to Dr. Shoikut Sarkar, sir, for making this event really a grand success. And last but not the least, I would like to thank all my dear participants across India for actively cooperating with all of us. Thank you. Stay 